Welcome back to another episode of Lost in the Farmer's Market Garden Shorts, where today we're going to be talking about this specimen here. And let's zoom in a little bit there. That one right in the center. No, not the big leaf one, the little fluffy leaf thing that a lot of people would mistake for a weed. This is Bloody Cranesbill, and unfortunately it's not cooperating with blooms, but it was blooming a few days ago, so that's... took me a year to get it mature enough to do that, so that's good. Um, its scientific name is Geranium sanguineum. Now, geranium comes from the Greek word geranos, meaning shaped like a crane. Or, no, it, the word means crane, and the seed pods look like a crane's bill, which is why this thing is called bloody crane's bill commonly. It has reddish flowers, which are they're small, but they're still worth it. You know, you get a good cluster of these going together, and they're really nice. Um, it's obviously in the Geraniaceae family, which is the geraniums. And um, we have a visitor. We have a yowling visitor here. What are you doing, yowler? Yeah, there we go. That's our official farm cat. She wants. She hears me speaking and thinks it's food time. Anyway. Um, it is native to Europe and northern Turkey. It will grow in USDA zones 3 through 9 and likes a soil pH roughly between 6.1 and 7.8. Now that is an open range and all the information I've found is sort of shotgun clustered in that. So that's the full range I've seen. Individual results, they vary. Its exposure is full sun to partial shade, but as you can see I have it in a partial shade kind of condition. Underneath... I'm under this St. John's Wort. And next to other things, like this lovely, that largely put next to it is a four o'clock, which has come back. They are perennial in the south, but that's, we'll get that in another video. <clears throat> the height can be eight inches to 18 inches, and the width can be 12 inches to 18 inches. So not bad. Other names for this plant are bloody geranium, blood red geranium, and uh, now we go on to the facts. It is an herbaceous, clump-forming perennial, meaning that it will die back to the ground every year and come back from root stock. It's sort of like big root geranium. You know, it, basically, you can mark where you plant it so you, you don't mistake it for weed and pull it up wrongfully. In this case, it's in a safe cluster. There's actually two sides. There's one over there next to the comfrey, which is not what can happen in this weather. And um, the great thing is that it tolerates rabbits and deer. They don't really mess with it, which is a wind out in the, out in the uh, you know, the wilderness, in the country. But uh, the leaves are fragrant and turn red in fall after they've had a frost, which is great. Um, I'm hoping this clump establishes and gets really bushy and then turns bright red in the fall. This is its second year, so it didn't bloom the first year. I got them in a four, four cell cell pack, so they were very small when I got these. And actually, technically, they were left over from the garden sale last year, but that's, that's beside the point. Now, what's interesting is this is potentially the most common type of geranium grown in the USA. There is a lawn weed, and I use the term lightly, that looks just like it. So, make sure you've gotten... Well, once you see the flowers, you'll know it's for real. The lawn weed has sort of periwinkle lavender flowers, and this has obviously red flowers. It's commonly used in rock gardens, and it's masked for ground cover. Now, I'm not using it in either of those ways. It's a naturalized plant that does well in our climate. So here, it's undergrowth for the St. John's wort, and in this case, the four clocks. It may have use in combating tuberculosis bacteria. There's some research on this. I haven't delved too deep into it, but... The research is coming out of legitimate laboratories, so that's kind of cool. I mean, if I ever get a case of the consumption, I can come out here and consumption some of these plants. Uh, well, okay, maybe not. See, uh, the leaves and flowers are edible, but they're really sour and bitter. So I'm guessing balsamic vinegar for the wind? I'm not really sure. Anyway, the reason I do recommend this for your garden is that it is a definitely low-maintenance perennial. Uh, the first year, you're going to have to water it more, obviously, but every year after that, it's easy to maintain. Um, it gets easier to maintain. You're going to have to drop down fertilizer. I don't fertilize this zone much, which is why it's so great. It's kind of... it needs a weeding, but it's natural. I'm not throwing up the air quotes like when we're talking about homeopathy. I mean, as in 
If it lives, it lives. If it dies, it dies. Now, I do rescue occasional plants out of here and move them elsewhere because I've screwed up in the first place. Like with putting hosta out here. Yeah. You see, I think you saw the bright green hosta in, in the hosta episode, so you'll know which one I'm talking about. That was rescued from a few feet behind this. But anyway, it's a unique plant with interesting foliage that turns a neat color. It has some medicinal uses. You can eat it. Its flowers are pretty. And it's naturalized, but it's non-invasive. This is why you probably want this in your garden. Now, you can get this from a bunch of nurseries, so your options are open. It's fairly inexpensive, which is always a win for me. You know, y'all saw, I'm sure y'all saw that lovely video where I talked about how much I coughed up for a whale fin snake plant. Yep. I don't recommend that, folks. But anyway, as always, keep them growing. Hit the like and subscribe if you like this video. And always, if you've got a question, a comment, please leave it. I read them. I read them all. Especially if you, if one of y'all want to drop a suggestion for content to be covered. As always, folks, thank you for watching, and stay tuned for the next video.